Shall we turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, beginning tonight with verse 13. Hereby we know that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. In John 12, 14, Jesus said to his disciples, 14, 12, I got that reversed there. He said to his disciples, at that day, you shall know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. How can we know that Jesus is dwelling in us? Well, we read here, because he has given to us of his spirit. When we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, allowing him to become the Lord, a transformation takes place in us. If any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and everything has become new. Peter wrote that we should live the rest of our life in the flesh, uh, that we should not live the rest of our life in the flesh, fulfilling the lusts of our flesh. But we now live, you're awake, that's good. We now live to do the will of God, for in our past life, we lived as the heathen. We walked in lasciviousness, lust, drinking, reveling, partying, partying and abominable practices wherein your old worldly friends think that you are strange because you do not run with them in the same excess of riot and they speak evil of you. In Romans 8, Paul made an interesting statement. He said, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Some of the commentators on this particular passage believe that the King James translators made an error in their translation because uh, in the Greek uh, there were no capitals and so where it speaks here that uh, you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if, the, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, if any man has not the spirit of Christ. And they believe that that spirit of Christ should not have been capitalized. Uh, the first two, yes, hereby, uh, you know, uh, we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, the Holy Spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. But if any man has not the spirit of Christ, and they believe that it should not have been capitalized, that it is actually referring to the nature of Christ. As a born again believer, my life should reflect Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter, but we all with open face as we behold the glory of the Lord are being changed from glory to glory in that, into that same image by his spirit that is working in us. In other words, we should be coming more like Christ as we behold him, as we worship him, there should be a transformation taking place in our lives uh, that the spirit of Christ might 
begin to be reflected from us. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that the Lord had given unto the church gifted men, some of them apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God into that perfect or complete man, fully matured, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ's nature being manifested from my life. Uh, this is what, uh, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, here in 1 John, perhaps he is also referring to this when he says he has given us of his spirit and not so much a reference to the third person of the Godhead, but that we have taken on the nature of Jesus Christ. And my life is becoming loving as he is loving, forgiving as he is forgiving, kind as he is kind caring as he is caring, that my life begins to show forth the characteristics of Jesus Christ. It is interesting to me that this becomes the proof of the fact that um, I am <laughs> dwelling in him and he is dwelling in me in that my life is becoming like his. It is interesting that it was in Antioch that the church was first called Christians. That is not something that they took upon themselves. That was an appellation that was given to them by the world. And it was because they were Christ-like. And so they called them Christians. I think that many times we may call ourselves Christians, and of course, I, I do believe that this is sort of a sad thing that so many people refer to themselves as Christians, but they are not at all Christ-like. Uh, the nature of Christ isn't being manifested in them at all, and really they sort of put a black mark on the word Christian uh, because they, they accept that for themselves, but they don't demonstrate that in the way they live. And so it's better that others call me a Christian than I go around bragging about being a Christian and then not living as Christ did live. And so uh, here, uh, John is saying, we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us, notice, of his spirit, uh, of the spirit of Jesus. It is manifested then in me. Verse 14, John says, and we have seen and we do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. We have seen and we do testify. Back in chapter 1, as John opens this little epistle, he said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked steadfastly upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, for the life was manifested and we have seen him, and we bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, 
that you might have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Paul is, I mean, John is sort of repeating here uh, from chapter 1, uh, the first three verses where he talks about that which was from the beginning, which we have seen, which we have heard, and all. When Joseph was told in a dream not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and that she was to have a son, and he was to call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. John said, we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The word Jesus is the Greek. It is a translation of the Hebrew word Joshua. Joshua in Hebrew is Jehovah is salvation. So his name implies his mission. Call his name Jesus, Joshua, for he shall save his people from their sin. We have seen, do testify, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save us from the power of sin. In Hebrews 2.15, it declares, and to deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It's amazing what power sin can exercise over a person's life. The bondage of corruption, the Bible calls it. And how many people are bound by sinful habits. It's amazing the power that it can manifest over a person's life. They know it is wrong. They know that it is destroying them. And yet, in spite of all of their efforts, they can't stop. That's bondage. When you are doing things you know you shouldn't do, things you really don't want to do, things that you realize are doing harm to you, and yet you can't stop doing them. And though you struggle, though you try uh, to cease doing it, you find that you do not have the power to stop the bondage of corruption. But Jesus came to save those that were bound in sin. And he can do for you what you can't do for yourself. That is, he can set you free from the power of sin that has a foothold in your life. Those things that you've been struggling so hard to be freed from, Jesus can set you free tonight. He can deliver you from sin. Jesus said in John 8.36, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus can set you free tonight, and you will be free indeed. We read that Jesus had gone into the synagogue in Capernaum on the Sabbath day, and they handed him the scriptures to read, and they handed him the Isaiah scroll. And he opened up the Isaiah scroll to the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives. And that's what we're talking about. Captive to sin. But Jesus is saying that he came to deliver those who were captives and the recovering of the sight to those that are blind and to set at liberty those who are bruised. Luke tells us that he then closed the scroll and he said to the people, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your sight. He had come to deliver the captive. And if you have been captivated by some sinful practice, he has come to set you free to deliver the captive. He came also to deliver us from the consequences of our sin. We sing that song, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. But delivering us from the consequences of sin. The Bible tells us that the soul that sins shall surely die. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, the animal became the substitute for the sinful man who would place his hands upon the head of the animal and confess his sins, and then the priest would slit the throat, catch the blood in a basin, and pour it out upon the altar, and that sacrifice died as a substitute for the man. He deserved the death. It was his sin, but he transferred it over onto the animal, and the animal died in his place. And that was the practice through the Old Testament, but it was all looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, who would take our sins upon himself and be the substitute sacrifice for us. He died as a substitute for me, that I wouldn't have to die because of my sin. The wages of sin is death. He was crucified, put to death for me. My sacrifice upon my sins were upon him, as the Lord declared in Isaiah, that uh, God placed on him the iniquities of us all. And thus, in his death, it was a substitution for you and for me, dying in our place that we would not have to die. All of my iniquities on him were laid. He bore them all on the tree. Jesus, the debt of my sin fully paid. He paid the ransom for me. One day, Jesus is going to save us from the presence of sin. We're living in a very sinful world. We're surrounded by sin and of course, living in this sinful world, there are those appeals of the world to our flesh. And we find ourselves often struggling, the flesh against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, as we are battling against the temptations uh, of our flesh by the world in which we live. But one day the Lord is going to deliver us even from the presence of sin. What a glorious day that shall be. Daniel said, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In Revelation 21, 27, we read, and there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything that defiles, nor works 
abominations or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into heaven. For without the gates are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loves and tells lies. So when we enter into heaven, nothing is going to enter in except those who are pure and holy and righteous through their faith in Jesus Christ. Without the sinful world, uh, but within those heavenly gates, uh, those who are following after Jesus. In verse 15, he goes on to say, And whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, dwelleth in him, and he in God. Today there are many cults in our world, many New Agers, and they have become extremely deceptive. They can use language that makes you think that they believe just like you believe. But they have a different glossary. They have a different uh, interpretation of the words so that they can say the right words and you hear them and you hear them as they're uh, talking about born again and so forth. But being born again means something entirely different to them than it means to us. Uh, to say that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God means something entirely different to them than it does to us. And uh, thus, uh, they become very deceptive in their uh, language and in their statements because listening to them, you think, wow, they are, they are just right in line with us. Uh, they believe just like we do. A while back, I had the opportunity uh, to meet with some ministers up at Biola uh, with one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon church along with the president of Brigham Young University. And uh, we were there for dialogue. And uh, I was absolutely amazed how that these men in the dialogue, you would believe that they are just sound fundamentalist, that they believe in the fundamental truths of the Bible. And, and they were so deceptive in our discussion. And uh, it's just that they can say the things that we're saying, only they mean something entirely different. There is a minister locally, has a large church, and he talks about sin and the need to be born again. But his definition of sin is low self-esteem. And so if you have a low self-esteem, you're a sinner. And being born again is developing a high esteem of yourself. Coming away from the low esteem and having a very high esteem, that's being born again. But when you hear him talk, talking about sin and the tragedy of sin and how it hurts and mars so many lives, and they need to be born again. You think, wow, this guy's right on. But yet, when you look at what he defines to be sin and what he defines to be born again, he's talking about something entirely different than what we talk about when we mention sin and the need to be born 
again. The Jehovah Witnesses will tell you that they believe that Jesus is a son of God. They believe it in the same way that the scripture says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know when he appears, we're going to be like him. We'll see him as he is. And so in that kind of understanding of believing that Jesus is a son of God, and, and, and they'll say, oh, yes, we believe that he is a son of God. Uh, but again, it's just like, and so are you. And so is everybody, you know, they're sons of God. And, and so they are saying something different in their interpreting of what they're saying than what we say. We believe that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. And they might even say that too, but they'll mean something entirely different when they say it. They believe that Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel. They believe that all of us will one day be, who believe will be sons, well, not all of us, all of the Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, you won't make it. You'll, uh, you know, have to be a servant in their kingdom. But uh, that they will all be sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be. The Mormons, they declare that Jesus they believe him to be the son of God and that he came to this earth to die for our sins. But they also believe that they are gods or have the God potential. And because they are faithful Mormons and because their marriages were sealed in the temple ceremonies, that uh, when they die, they will go with their celestial wife to some planet out in the universe and they will populate that planet and they'll watch over the development of uh, those people on that planet and they will be the gods of that planet. And so that Adam came to this earth with one of his celestial wives, Eve, and they began to populate the earth and so you know, when they talk about, oh, yes, we believe that Jesus is, you know, the Son of God, and he came to die for our sins. They're talking about a different Jesus. Uh, the Jesus of the Mormon church is a brother to Lucifer. And uh, Elohim uh, was talking about the redeeming of the earth, and Lucifer gave his plan of redemption and then Jesus, his brother, gave his plan of redemption and when Elohim chose the plan that Jesus submitted, it made his brother Lucifer angry and he's gone about to try and disrupt uh, the plan of redemption that was offered through Jesus Christ. So, it seems to me that just saying, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You'll definitely get an affirmative answer. Oh, yes, we do. But if you would ask, do you believe that Jesus is God the Son? Then you'll find a different response because they do not believe in the Trinity, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to think of Jesus as God in the flesh, God the Son, uh, is where they begin to break down. Now, here's what John is saying, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and and that's the idea that he is God the Son. Uh, whosoever uh, shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, 
God dwelleth in him and he in God. But that is, of course, uh, the crucial uh, litmus test that they need to pass to really have the, the Lord dwelling in them. If we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, then God dwells in us and we dwell in him. And what a glorious place that is. Dwelling in the Lord, him dwelling in us. Father, help us that we might truly confess without reservation, mental or otherwise, and without an attempt to deceive, that we will confess our faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is God who was manifested in the flesh, that he was in the beginning with you. He was there in the beginning, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And he became flesh and dwelt among us that we might behold his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have come to save us. Save us from the corruption of sin. Save us from the consequences of sin. Save us from the power of sin. And Lord, if there are those here tonight who have been struggling with some sinful practice, struggling so hard to try to free themselves and have found their own weakness and are bound by the fetters of sin. We pray tonight, Lord, that they might see our Lord Jesus Christ as one who has come to set the captive free. And may they be delivered, Lord, tonight from the sin that has kept them spiritually defeated. And Lord, we pray that you indeed will just so work in us that Christ's spirit might be manifested through us, that we will love as he loves, that we will care as he cares. Lord, let your beauty, let your nature be manifested in and through us, that people will know that we are Christians by our love and by our Christ-likeness. Lord, conform us into your image. Make us, Lord, like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front tonight to pray for you who may be struggling and would like deliverance tonight. Jesus came to set the captive free, to deliver those who were bound. And he can do a marvelous work. And I'm just looking forward to hearing some testimonies of the work of God's Spirit in transforming your life and giving you that power over sin. He came to save us, to save us from the power of sin. And so we encourage you to come on down to the front. If two or three of you agree on earth is touching any one thing, it will be done, Jesus said. And tonight could be your night that God has planned to set you free. And we would encourage you to just give God that opportunity to do his work tonight in your life.
to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask, to be like him, all through life's journey, from her to glory, all I ask, to be like him, don't know it, huh? try it, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask, to be like him, all through life's journey.